Okay, this is a quick revision uh, video on the origins of humans, and we're going to cover some of the genetic evidence of human evolution, and in covering that we'll cover some basic genetics and look at genetic variation. Um, so there's a whole series of lectures that I gave on human evolution, um, but all of these focus around the point that we're, we're looking about looking at where humans came from and the genetic evidence that says that humans came from a common ancestor of chimps and then a common ancestor of all mammals and so on. But we're really interested in the more recent genetic changes that have made humans humans. Um, so we're going to cover the genetic evidence, you know, looking at our similarities to chimps, similarities to other mammals. We're going to look at the rate of mutation and accumulation of genetic damage, and that genetic damage um, defines the genetic changes that are present in humans, but say, let's say not chimps. And then we're going to look at mitochondrial versus Y chromosome haplotyping in later lectures um, and look at how we can use this sort of genetic information to map uh, population movements. So just as a quick overview, we can see that uh, humans and chimps uh, separated from each other relatively recently in the last 10 million years um, although we didn't humans didn't separate from chimps we separated from chimps via a common ancestor which was here and then there was a common ancestor of great apes here which is where the split between human chimps gorillas which also appear and the orangutans and then we can see a common ancestor of our group the primates with other primates and so on so this gives you a, a scale in millions of years, about how far, how far back we are going. What we know is that at this point here, there was a split between the chimpanzee group and some of the other grey apes, which have 48 chromosomes, and humans, which have 46 chromosomes. And those 46 chromosomes in humans, that is present in all of the human groups. So that's Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens. So this is summarised here on this plot. So we've got 10 million years here. Um, separation from a common ancestor with gorillas, which had 48 chromosomes, is about 9 million years ago. Separation from a common ancestor with chimps. Um, that group retained 48 chromosomes. We have got 46 chromosomes. Then about 3 million years ago, we've got um, this particular sort of subspe uh, species of primitive hominid about three, three and a half million years ago in Africa. Then up here, uh, we've got several uh, lines of hominids leaving Africa. So one to two million years ago, we know hominids left Africa and colonized Europe, uh, and mostly Asia. They seem to have given rise to uh, Neanderthals, Denisovans, um, which lived in Asia and Europe during that time. And then subsequently, we've got Homo sapiens leaving Africa uh, 130,000 years ago, and then a second wave 80,000 years ago, which we think populated uh, Asia and Europe and subsequently Australasia. Um, so we think that basically the population of um, Europe, Asia, Australasia came from this 80,000 year ago uh, wave of migration out of Africa. Now, since uh, Homo sapiens left Africa, let's say 80,000 years ago, they then came into contact with previous species or subspecies of Homo sapiens which were already living in Asia and Europe. So these are the uh, Denisovans, particularly in Asia, and Neanderthals in, in Europe, but also in Asia. And what this illustrates is the amount of movement of DNA due to interbreeding between these different hominid species. So what we can see is the African population who didn't leave Africa have got no Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA within them. So if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, you find very, very little uh, Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA. Whereas if you look at Europe, Asia and Australasia, you see that there is, particularly in uh, Europe, there's quite a bit of Neanderthal DNA. In 
areas of Asia, particularly the Denisovan DNA. And what we know that these uh, populations were interbreeding with the waves of Homo sapiens that moved into the areas where they were living and had been there, living there for hundreds of thousands of years. So what this shows is the movement of uh, Homo sapiens through Southeast Asia. Um, and what we think is that 60,000 or so years ago, uh, populations moved through into Australia. And these picked up uh, Denisovan uh, DNA. And what we can see in Australian populations and Papua New Guinea is quite high levels of um, Denisovan DNA within them relative to other populations which tend not to have picked up this DNA. We can see just from this map here where we uh, the first Denisovans were identified which is in uh, Central Asia. So the way, reason we know this is that we've identified DNA from the cave here of this uh, ancient hominid species which we call Denisovans and then we look for markers in the DNA from the bones here and look for markers which are unique to Denisovans and not present in modern Homo sapiens or Neanderthals and we can say okay this is a genetic marker for this population and then we look for those populations in uh, so look for DNA markers associated with these populations in other populations from around the world and we find the highest concentration of genetic markers relating to this population, the Denisovans, in native Australians and Papua New Guinea and some of the Polynesian islands, suggesting that a wave of migration came through um, this region here. Interbreeding occurred between modern humans leaving Africa 80,000 years ago and the existing Denisovan population that were living in this region here, and then that DNA has been carried down this route down to Australia. And this allows us to track populations as they migrated tens of thousands of years ago. So we know that Neanderthal and Denisovan genetic signatures exist in modern humans, but not in most Africans. And we know that Denisovan DNA exists most commonly in Southeast Asia. So that suggests that this population were present as modern humans migrated through that area. Now we know all of this because DNA mutates at a fairly constant rate. We know that populations that are separated will accumulate mutations independently of each other. So if a mutation occurs, let's say in the Denisovans, and they've been living isolated from other humans for half a million years, those mutations in the Denisovans should be fairly easy to identify from uh, modern humans and then you can track how much Denisovan DNA is present. Now when we look at some genes we find some genes mutate very quickly, some genes mutate very slowly and we can use these almost like a molecular clock for evolution studies. Uh, some genes, particularly the histones which you've heard about in the previous lecture and the Hox genes which I mentioned very briefly in the previous lecture, these mutate very very slowly because they're absolutely fundamental um, to how um, the organisms are put together. Others mutate much more quickly and then non-coding DNA mutates quicker still. When I say mutates quicker, it all mutates at the same rate, it's just that non-coding DNA mutations are left in the genome whereas mutations in Hox genes and histones tend to result in death of the organism so therefore mutations are very rarely carried forward to the next generation. This is just showing the frequency of histone uh, mutations between different species. So you can see humans, mouse, rat, cow, chimp, and this is the amino acid sequence, not the DNA sequence. Uh, so we're only really interested in mutations that affect coding sequence for this plot. And what you can see is that humans and chimps are the most closely related, and you can see that we've got the same amino acid here and here, whereas all the others have got uh, a different amino acid. Same there, same there. Then at this particular place you can see that humans and chimps are the same. Uh, cow, rat and mouse are all different from each other. So that gives you some idea as to what is the order of events of evolution. 
and just based on this change alone, you would guess that humans and chimps and cows are more closely related to each other as a group than mouse and rat. And then from this change, you would suggest that humans, chimps, cows and rats are more closely related to each other and mouse is sort of a bit of a, an outlier. Now, sometimes these can be a little bit misleading um, in that mouse and rat are actually very closely related to each other. When you build up changes that have occurred under over thousands of genes, you can build up a, a very definite picture of the order of events in evolution. Now these are the Hox genes. This is I've briefly mentioned these in the past. This is a bunch of genes which regulate body segments and how they differentiate in embryogenesis. And these mutate at a very, very slow rate. Um, what we find is that in the key regions of these genes, or the coding sequence, there's no amino acid changes between us and chimpanzees, or indeed mouse. So if you see human uh, amino acid sequence there and the mouse amino acid sequence there there's absolutely no change between us and mouse because this is a very highly conserved gene even when you look at between humans and fruit fly there's not an awful lot of change because it's such a fundamental gene in other genes which are quite not not quite so fundamental or not even coding sequences we find mutations occur much more quickly and this is just one example that i talked about which is a gene called the nanog p8 gene which is a not a proper gene really and what we find is that if you look at the chimpanzee chromosome 15 there's this sequence here which matches exactly the same to the human chromosome 15 with the exception that there's a couple of thousand bases of DNA that have been slotted in and that couple of thousand bases of DNA is what we call the nanog p8 gene and this is just one recent so almost like newly created gene that has occurred between uh, since our split between humans and chimps. So no chimps have got this nano P8 gene. And just skipping forward a, a few slides, this nano P8 gene exists and it's, it's a copy of the ancestral nano gene um, and we think this gene emerged about a million years ago and nano P8 sequences have been found in Neanderthals. So that suggests that uh, prior to our split with Neanderthals, the nanog P8 gene was present in those um, previous populations. So we're both humans and Neanderthals have got the nanog P8 gene, but chimpanzees don't have it. So we know that that is an event that has happened since our split with the common ancestor of chimpanzees. And it's data like this, uh, thousands of different locations throughout the genome that has allowed us to um, follow the order of, uh, order of events of evolution. Uh, in later lecture, I'll talk about how we use things like SNP chips and whole genome sequencing to come to even uh, more accurate predictions of the order of events.